My name is Stacy Richards, and just before starting my third year of college, I made a decision. That year was going to be the year I finally loosened up and embraced the full college experience. See, I had always been a reserved and studious person, but after the summer leading into my junior year, I realized I had missed out on many things I should have been doing, so I promised myself that year would be different. With that in mind, I kept an eye out for every upcoming party and potential club to join. Now, while the partying part went well enough, I quickly realized that joining clubs or sororities as a junior was almost impossible since most people had already sorted that out as freshmen. Luckily, on my way back to the dorms one day, I spotted a flyer for a club that seemed perfect for me at the time called the Surreal Collective. From what I could tell, it focused on exploring and creating abstract and surrealist art through distinct and expressive methods instead of traditional art forms. Simply put, it was a club for people who expressed themselves through weird art that wasn't just paintings, music, or drama, and this was perfect for me because, despite the fact I was an engineering major, I always had a thing for abstract art. Plus, I figured it would introduce me to a whole new group of people, which was an exciting thought at the time. I joined the club the following week, and after spending a few days with the members, it turned out to be exactly what I'd hoped for. By then, I had already formed close relationships with almost everyone, the closest being a guy named Jacob and his younger brother, Donald Trapp. Both were Caucasian, around six feet tall, with black hair. Jacob was in his final year, and Donald was a junior like me. Personality-wise, however, they were completely different. And to be honest, the only reason I interacted with Donald at first was because of how well I got along with Jacob. Donald just always happened to be around without really saying or doing much. After a while, my relationship with Jacob began to evolve, and we started going to parties, dinners, and abstract art galleries together. Eventually, Jacob told me he was planning to take me to one of his favorite art spots in the city. But when he arrived that night, to my surprise, he showed up with Donald lurking behind and simply staring at me without saying anything. When I asked him about it, he said Donald insisted on coming because he was bored and wanted to hang out with Jacob. That was one of the early warnings I had about Donald Trapp, but I decided not to think too much about it and went to the gallery anyway. To my surprise, the place was nearly empty, with only a few odd-looking men scattered around the studio. The art that night was definitely abstract, but this time in a way that didn't sit right with me. There were numerous pictures of men and women with their eyes sealed shut with wax or gouged out. It also depicted strange images of people and animals covered in scars while singing, dancing, or performing on stage to huge crowds of people. It didn't seem to face Jacob or Donald, though, so I decided to be more open-minded and stay the rest of the night until they were ready to leave. After about an hour or two, Jacob signaled it was time to go, drove me back to my dorm, and kissed me for the first time that night. He said a few things and gave me a hug, but I could barely focus on what he was saying as my attention kept drifting to Donald, who was standing outside the car. Even though I could barely see his face, I could feel his eyes locked on me from a distance. My attention was drawn back to Jacob as he pulled away from the hug, looked me in the eyes and said, I will see you soon, okay? Before leaving. The days following the art gallery visit were some of the worst of my life. Jacob seemed to have completely vanished, like he had fallen off the face of the earth, while his brother Donald slowly started appearing everywhere I went. First, he suddenly showed up in most of my classes, and it only got creepier from there as I began seeing him at the library, parties, restaurants, and even near my dorm. Sometimes, when I couldn't see him directly, I was certain someone was watching me. After five days of non-stop stalking, I was terrified, barely leaving my room. I kept convincing myself not to go to the cops, hoping that Donald was just being his usual weird self and that things would return to normal once Jacob showed up again. But as the days turned into weeks with no sign of Jacob for almost a month, I started piecing everything together. I couldn't shake the fear that something had happened to him, possibly at the hands of his own brother. If that was the case, I didn't know what Donald's plan was for me, but I was terrified to find out so I decided to leave campus and go home for a couple of days. The date was August 23rd, 2021, and I had spent just three days at home relaxing 
and trying to forget about everything happening at school. To keep myself distracted, I had begun helping my parents pick my little sister up from school every day. That afternoon, after I picked her up, she begged nonstop for me to take her to the park like our mom usually did, and I decided to indulge her as it seemed like something she had been looking forward to all day. Once we got to the park, I realized I had made the right decision going as it was the most distracted I'd been since coming home. Watching my kid sister play with all that childlike innocence actually made me feel happy. After a while, I get up to let her know we were leaving, but as I sat beside her on the grass, something out of the corner of my eye made my heart sink to my stomach. I struggled to make him out from a distance, but after a few seconds, I was sure. The man watching us from across the street was Donald. Get up now, Charlotte. We're leaving, I said urgently before scrambling to my feet. Donald had started to slowly approach us, but before he could get too close, the roar of a van speeding toward us caught my attention. I watched in horror as the driver plowed over two people before screeching to a halt not too far from where my sister and I stood. At that moment, I was frozen and terrified, trying to make sense of what was happening. For a brief moment, I felt a wave of relief when I saw Jacob step out of the van before walking toward me slowly. Hey, what's up, Sandra? I heard you were back home, so I came to visit, he said casually as if I hadn't just witnessed him run over two random people. Come here. I've missed you so much. I want to show you how much, he continued, his voice unsettling. I started backing away as I clutched my sister tightly. He had a crazy look in his eyes. His hair was disheveled, and the way he looked at us sent a chill down my spine. He wasn't the Jacob I knew, and just by looking at him, I could tell there was something deeply wrong with him. His crazed gaze was locked on me, not Charlotte, like a predator eyeing its prey. So without a second thought, I did what I had to do to protect my sister. I ran. Jacob chased after me, laughing like a maniac as I ran deeper into the park. I could hear his voice calling from behind. Come here, Sandra. Come here. I knew I couldn't outrun him if I had taken my sister, and I also knew he would come after me, giving her a chance to get some help from the people nearby. I didn't think I'd get far, though, and when I looked back, I saw Jacob closing the distance fast, with Donald now gaining ground behind us, too. My breath was running out, so I ducked into the playground and hid under the slide, praying the cops would arrive before Jacob found me, but that wasn't the case. There you are, baby, he said, grabbing my throat and squeezing as he slid in behind me. Why do you run from me, huh, Stacy? Didn't you miss me? He said as he leaned in, smiling. I saw all your missed calls, you know. It wasn't easy waiting, but it was my art demands. I had to wait until you were ready. But today, when I saw you with that child, I just, I just couldn't resist. I knew you'd both be perfect for my next exhibit. My vision blurred as my throat tightened, and he dragged me out from under the slide by my hair. Come on, you stupid bitch, come on! He screamed. A million thoughts raced through my mind at that moment, but the only thing I knew for sure was that I couldn't let him take me. As I started kicking, screaming, and struggling, Jacob crouched over me furiously before slashing at me with a blade. Don't fuck with me, Sandra! He screamed, holding the knife to my throat. Don't fuck with me or I swear. Jacob's words were cut short as Donald slammed into him and the two of them began wrestling on the ground. I didn't understand what was happening, but I didn't wait to find out. I bolted up and ran toward my sister just as police sirens filled the air. In less than three minutes, the park was swarming with cop cars and ambulances. After I found my younger sister and gave my statement, I sat in an ambulance waiting to receive treatment and find out what happened with Donald and Jacob. The cops returned later with Jacob in handcuffs, bloodied and bruised, and a few minutes after that, some men returned with a body bag, and I was told Donald was inside after being stabbed multiple times by Jacob. Weeks passed, and the investigation revealed more than any of us could have imagined, surprising not just my family, but the authorities as well. It turned out that the art gallery Jacob had taken me to that night was preparing to move out just as the police arrived. They uncovered that many of the gallery's visitors had prior charges, and some even had hostages or victims tied up in their homes. 
mutilated to create art for the gallery. The process was more twisted than it initially seemed. These psychopaths would bring their potential victims to the gallery early on, seeking some sort of approval from the attendees. Once approved, the victims would be stalked for months before being kidnapped and mutilated. Jacob confessed to the police that he was a promising up-and-coming member of this disturbing community. His brother Donald knew about his actions, but chose not to report him. Instead, he tried to watch over Jacob's potential victims, warning them if they were in danger. Tragically, Donald's life could have been much simpler if he had just turned Jacob in. As it seemed, Jacob didn't share the same sense of brotherly loyalty, boasting that seeing Donald's stabbed body was a better piece of art than the Mona Lisa. The feeling of being watched by someone every day of your life is something that doesn't go away easily. I still have that lingering feeling every time I step outside of my home, and what makes it even worse is the knowledge that the true psychopaths are never the most obvious ones, meaning you never truly know just who might be watching you walk down the street. This story is loosely inspired by the real-life case of Lisa Ziegert. In 1992, Lisa was a 24-year-old woman from Agawam, Massachusetts. She was abducted, stalked, and murdered by a man named Gary Shara. Shara had been stalking her for some time leading up to her kidnapping. He wrote in a journal that he had been obsessed with Lisa and had followed her for days before committing the crime. He had planned the abduction meticulously, stalking her movements before acting on his violent intentions. Shara had also written confessions, outlining his obsession with Lisa and the premeditated nature of the crime. Though Lisa was tragically killed, the long investigation and persistence of law enforcement to solve her case finally brought justice to her and her family after 25 years. It happened on the 14th of May, 2008. I had started seeing him around work, a month before that day. I remember the very first time I spotted him. I was on a lunch break with my friends at work, and he was standing outside the restaurant, staring at me. I recall my friend Allison saying, It looks like you have an admirer, Noelle. And that's when I looked up to see her pointing at him. The man looked like he was in his mid-thirties. He had green eyes and a medium build and his black hair looked unkempt. I assumed that was all it was at first, as I told myself that he was just an admirer, but it didn't take long before I realized in the following weeks that he was something much more than that. I thought I was crazy at first, as I assumed I had started seeing things. I thought I had seen him at my dentist a few days after the first time as I could have sworn he was the same man sitting across the room and spying on me through a magazine. The next time I saw him was when I quickly spotted him at a party for one of my friends, Charlotte. These strange sightings just kept increasing from there, and I told myself it couldn't all be crazy coincidences. I wasn't the type of person to jump to a rash conclusion about something, but as I kept spotting him everywhere I went, I soon realized that this man was a stalker. The first thing I thought about doing was to call the cops, but after putting in a lot of thought, I didn't. I figured I didn't have any solid evidence to prove that this man was stalking me. I mean, it was a very small town, and I knew telling the police I was seeing someone everywhere I went wouldn't make a proper case. Plus, it was my word against his. It was a dangerous decision, but I decided to wait for more substantial proof against this man before I took it to the police station. I did, however, take the necessary measures to protect myself in case things got much worse. Knowing fully well that this man was my stalker now, it was as if I constantly had a pair of eyes looking at me throughout the month of April. I had started seeing him much more frequently as I spotted him in my neighborhood and around my house. Things continued like this into the month of May, and it wasn't till the 14th of May that he finally confronted me. I was walking home from work when I heard footsteps behind me. I didn't need to look around to tell who it was. I already knew it was him. Luckily, 
I wasn't too far from a public place, so I increased my pace. But right before I could reach it, my stalker caught up to me. I was frightened, but I kept my composure, and before I could say anything, my stalker looked at me and said, I'm sorry, miss, but who are you? I was baffled at his statement, as I wondered why he, of all people, would ask me that. So I said, Excuse me? I'm the one meant to be asking you that question. You're the one who's been following me around, you sick freak. My stalker now had a surprised look on his face, as he realized I already knew what he had been doing for the past month. So he looked me dead in the eyes as he said, Yes, I have been following you around for the past month, but that's all your fault. Don't act like you didn't start all this. You made me do this. So tell me, who are you? I was convinced now that this man was probably clinically insane, as I had absolutely no idea what he was talking about. My stalker, who now had an annoyed look in his eyes, continued with, <sighs> Look. I've tried to go about this the nice way, by following you around and trying to figure out what you did to me. But I can't take it anymore. Tell me the truth. Tell me why. Why am I seeing you in my dreams? His last statement confirmed my suspicions, as I knew for a fact now that he was crazy. I didn't say anything, as I had nothing to tell him, and I knew anything I said would just make things potentially worse. That's when he screamed the words. Answer me! As he made his way towards me, I then told him, Stay away from me, you psycho, or I'm going to scream and defend myself. My warnings fell on deaf ears as he kept approaching me, so I screamed at the top of my lungs. I knew we were close to a public area, so my scream attracted attention and it wasn't long till someone came running in. It was a young man who had been jogging alone, and immediately he reached the scene. He said, Are you all right, miss? I heard screaming. My crazy stalker then made another statement that baffled me as he looked at the young man and said, Stay away from her, man. She's dangerous. The young man, who wasn't convinced, then looked at me and said, Do you know this man, miss? So I quickly responded with, No, he's an insane man who's been following me around, and he just threatened to attack me. That's why I screamed. Leave her alone, sir, or I'm calling the cops. But my stalker didn't leave as he replied, You don't understand. She's the evil one here. Why can't you just see that? I didn't want to hurt anyone else. But you leave me no choice. And with that, he attacked the young man. They struggled for a while, and it gave me some time to reach for my phone and call the cops. I tried to leave after I made the call, but it wasn't long before my stalker took down the young man and made his way toward me. I knew running away would be pointless, so I stood my ground, and right when he was about to attack, I reached into my purse and brought out my mace. I didn't hesitate as I sprayed it right into his eyes. He fell to the floor screaming, and I could finally hear the police sirens in the distance. An investigation was opened up, and I told the cops everything I knew. I also provided them with the recorded voice note of the whole incident. I had started recording with my phone when I heard him walking behind me earlier, as I knew it would be undeniable evidence. All this in addition to the witness testimony from the young man, the case was already closed. I remember during my questioning, an officer asked me, Are you sure you don't know this man? He seems pretty convinced that you do. Plus, we've checked his records and he hasn't committed any prior crimes before this. So, I responded with, I can assure you, officer, that I don't know that man. Maybe he went mad or something, but I truly don't know him and why he did all this. The officer then responded with, Okay, miss. We'll see to it that this man is punished accordingly, and we'll call you if we need any additional statements. As I walked out of the station, I had a smile on my face, 
as my little white lie had convinced them all. I actually knew that man, and his name was Charles Reed. I had seen him in a coffee shop about three months ago, and I fell in love with him. I followed him around till I found out where he lived, and most nights I would sneak into his house and watch him sleep. I eventually took our relationship to the next level as I would often drug him with a psychedelic drug called psilocybin. It's a drug that distorts a person's sense of reality and puts them in a dreamlike state. That's when I would climb into his bed and fondle him. I know this modern day society would see this the wrong way, but I've realized this is the best and only way for me to have relationships as I'm not really an attractive woman, so there's always a possibility of being shot down. Plus, it's so much better than dating or getting to know each other, as I'm just getting to the good parts. I always ask myself, what's the point of going through the entire hassle of dating if I can just get to the best parts? Most of you wouldn't understand as modern society has put all these fake values into your heads. I live my life like an elite human, as I see what I want and take it, no matter the costs. It was quite unfortunate that it had to end up like this, as I had hoped he'd just let it go, like my other partners. But he had to be inquisitive, so... I elaborately set this entire thing up to get him off my back. I heard he was charged with stalking and attempted assault, so he'd been given three to four years. And while it did hurt me to know that I wouldn't be seeing him soon, I was fine with it, as I already had my new prey in sight. His name was John Miller, and he was my co-worker at work. He never really pays any attention to me, and I know he doesn't see me that way, but in the end, none of that matters, as I know he'll be with me tonight. <laughs> <laughs>